Hi, boys and girls. It's Miss Manning here. Today, we are going to be working on Lesson 12, and we're going to start a new story called Operation Clean Sweep. Um, today, our focus is going to be comparing and contrasting two or more characters, and we're going to do that by drawing on the specific details from the text, which is just fancy talk for saying we got to back up what we say with text evidence. So the steps for us to do this is first, we have to look and identify two or more characters that have similarities and differences within the text. So we can't always do it with every single character that's in our story. Sometimes our author doesn't give us enough details about one or more characters. And we also have to be able to find ways that they are alike and ways that they are different. Um, the next step is when we compare, we are finding ways that they are similar and we have to have more than just one example. When we contrast, we have to find ways that they are different, uh, and we have to find, again, more than just one example. And then we identify those specific details from the text or text evidence that supports the comparison and the contrast, uh, the compare and contrast that we've made with our characters. So when we're reading today, we are going to come across the word smallpox, and that's just a, a deadly contagious disease. The good news is it's a disease that they developed a vaccine for, and so it's not um, seen in the United States anymore because um, it has been eradicated or um, gotten rid of. So while we're reading, we're gonna read, read pages 67 through 74. I want you to think, why didn't Otis believe Corn when he told him that the women in town were running for political office. Operation Clean Sweep. Cornelius Sandwick and his best friend Otis live in the small town in Oregon called Umatilla. The year is 1916. The two boys enjoy fishing and collecting arrowheads. For the most part, life in Umatilla is pretty simple. But one day, the boys' lives are turned upside down when they discover that the women of Umatilla, who recently won the right to vote, have decided to exercise their new rights in a very unexpected way. You watch the kids while I go get us some chow, I told Otis after I changed Daisy. I handed her to Otis and she immediately grabbed his nose and yanked his hair. Ouch, he said. Oh, I forgot to warn you. Daisy's new trick is pulling hair. Now you tell me. I took the side door into the kitchen. Just as, just as I was about to open the kitchen door to the dining room, I heard mom say, sisters, if we're going to carry this off, we can't tell any man in town, not our husbands, our brothers, our fathers, not even our sons. I stopped cold in my tracks. Sons? What on earth was she talking about? Our next meeting will be tomorrow night, nine o'clock at the library. That's right, Mrs. McKee said. Right, or remember the password? Operation Clean Sweep, the lady said in unison. I held my breath and pressed my ear against the door to the dining room. Tomorrow night, we'll make our nominations, Mom continued. Nominations? Now I was really confused. Surely they were not talking about our town election. Those nominations? Those nominations were made a long time ago. And besides, women don't get involved in politics. They must be talking about some kind of women's club. That's it. They're probably talking about the knitting group they're in or their Christmas social to help poor people. I know who I'll be nominating, Mrs. Gill said. I could hear I could hear someone pouring tea. Cups clinked and spoons stirred. So first I wanna to talk to you real fast about the fact that this is our page in our story, uh, but I just took the page and I took a snippet of it and made it larger so you guys could see the text. The other thing I wanna to talk to you about before I continue reading is um, the text from here all the way down to here is in what we call italics, which means the words look slightly different. And the author will do that sometimes when the character is thinking. So these are things that he's thinking in his head. And then we know here because of the quotation marks that is being said by the character. But when you see that italics, it can mean that the character is thinking. Flora, you're just the person we need for mayor. Mayor, I gulped. Dad is mayor. It would be my honor and pleasure, Mom said. Just think, Flora. Your name will go down in the history books. People will be reading about you hundreds of years from now. Mayor Flora Sandwick, right here in Umatilla, Oregon. 
your name will be up there with all the great suffrage leaders like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. I stuck my fingers in both my ears and wiggled them to make sure I was hearing okay. I was. Sister, sister suffragists, I think we stand a very good chance of getting elected, Mom said. You know there are more women than men in this town. If we spread the word among ourselves and persuade enough women to vote for us, I think we can give the men of this town a run for their money. The ladies clicked their teacups and cheered. If I'm elected, Mom went on, the first thing I'm going to do is pay the town's back electric bill and reinstall the streetlights. I swallowed hard. Ever since Dad had taken office as mayor, he refused to pay the electric bill for the streetlights that didn't work. He and the electric company had been going round and round about whose responsibility it was to keep them working. Dad got real mad recently and had his men yank up about half of the lights, which made the street pretty scary come nighttime. Next, I'll make a law against chickens running rampant around town, Mom said, and then I'll move Elmer's grave. Poor old Elmer Diffenbaden. His grave was in the middle of Main Street. It used to be in the cemetery, but then Main Street was planned to go right through the part where Elmer had been laid to rest. The men who made the street said they'd move his grave, but they never did. Mom and her sisters were always complaining about it. Dad had said that the ladies were making a mountain out of a molehill. He didn't seem to mind swerving to Miss Elmer's toe. He didn't seem to mind swerving to Miss Elmer's tombstone. He said old, Elmer's gave, old Elmer gave Main Street lots of character. All the boys agreed with Dad. We thought Elmer's tombstone made a dandy place to sit and think about things. We liked to hang around it and tell ghost stories at night. Next, I'll fix the boards in the sidewalk, Mom said. They're a disgrace to this town. I agree, Mrs. Smith said. Have you noticed how bad the sidewalk is in the front of Butter Creek Telephone Company? There are three boards missing, and a person who wasn't looking would fall right through. Mr. Massey, owner of the telephone company, was known as a penny-pinching old geezer. He refused to fix his sidewalks, and he overcharged people for their telephone service. The side door opened, and in walked Otis, arms crossed, tape measure in hand, with a mad face. What's taking so long, he said. Shh, I said. I'm eavesdropping. What for? He put his ear to the dining room door. I don't hear nothing. Shh. Look, I'm tired of waiting. I've already measured every kid out there and the porch swing. I'm hungry. You can eavesdrop all you want, but I'm going in there for some chow. Otis pushed open the dining room door, and I tagged behind him. Oh, uh, boys, hello, Mom said, looking surprised. How long have you two been standing there? Us? Um, not long. We each pulled, a, grabbed a plate and piled it full of sandwiches, deviled eggs, and cookies. Mom dished up bowls of soup, and then we headed back to the front porch to watch the little nose pickers and di diaper stinkers. So, so what? So what were they saying that was so interesting? I took a bite of my sandwich and chewed it carefully, thinking about how to reply. You won't believe it. I don't even believe it. Try me. I can't. Since when have you not been able to tell me something? Otis asked. He was right. Otis knew everything. He knew about my little brother who died from smallpox when he was only one month old. He knew about the arrowhead collection under my bed. He even knew about my embarrassing fear of the dark and that I had to have the hall light on to go to sleep and that if he blabbed it to any of the guys in school, he'd be in big trouble. So what's the deal? Well, I said, taking another bite. I'm not exactly sure, but it sounds like, like what? Like all the ladies are planning on running for office in our upcoming election, and my mom's going to run for mayor. Otis lifted his eyebrows. Very funny, corncob. You're a real joker. Now tell me the truth. I just did, Oatmeal. I'm not supposed to, be am I'm supposed to believe that? He got out his tape measure and tapped me on the head. Women don't run for political office especially for mayor. Come on, corn. I'm smarter than that. See, I knew you wouldn't believe me. A woman can't be mayor. Why, that's, that's a man's job. I know, I said. They're plum crazy. They're loony birds, Otis said, sap, uh, soup dripping from down his chin. 
How do they expect a man to vote for a woman? Well, that's the thing, I said, drinking my own soup. According to them, there are more women in this town than men. And if they get most of the women's votes, they think they'll win. You think they can really do that? Otis shook his head. Nah. Why would a woman want to vote for another woman when she could vote for a man? Beats me. They were talking about a password in a secret meeting tomorrow night at the library. Secret meeting? What's the password? Operation Clean Sweep. What the heck is that supposed to mean? I think it means Umatilla is going to get a clean sweep, but not by a broom. Then... Then by what? The women. Then our next vocab word is rampant. So the sentence, next I'll make a law against chickens running rampant around town. So if we look at the previous word running, that would be the verb. So rampant is describing how they are running. So it makes it an adverb in this case. So the chickens running rampant around town. So I just picture all of these chickens going in all different directions. I mean, chickens don't exactly walk in a, a nice little pile or a line. They don't stay in a herd like sheep or cows do. They kind of just kind of go wherever they want to. They're a little um, frantic. And so they're running all over, taking over the town. So the question that I want to start with is, how does the author establish the historical time period in our story? So I want you to pause the video and look throughout the text to find some evidence of how you know what the time period is. How do you know when the story is taking place? So go ahead and pause the video. Okay, what I came up with is um, on this first page, and this is just one example, um, but it's the sentence where it says women don't get involved in politics. That wouldn't be a phrase that you would hear now. That wouldn't be a phrase that you would um, expect to hear your dad or your brother or your teachers or whoever it is to say, um, because it's just a, a thing where it's not a, a men or a woman thing. Every citizen is involved in politics and, and talking about it and has a right to vote and, and get involved. So th this gives you an idea of the mindset um, of, of the people at that time. Our next question, um, you're just going to look at these two pages, but how does Flora's plans for the town contrast with her husband's ideas? So um, here I'm, I would encourage you to pause the video and look for the differences in, in their two ideas for what the town needs. Okay, so I'm going to give you one example that I found. And the example just at the beginning is that mom wants to turn the town's electricity back on. She wants to pay that bill so that way they can get the street lights working again. So when we contrast, we have to talk about how they're different. So that's Flora's plans. Now we need to know what her husband plans. Her husband plans are for the electric bill. And it says that he refused to pay the bill because, he di because they didn't work. And so he kind of was in a battle with the electric company saying, once you get those lights fixed, we'll pay the bill. And they're saying, you get the lights fixed and then they'll work and then you can pay your bill, but you need to pay your bill. So it was just this debate other, whether he should pay or not. And mom just wanted the lights back on and installed. So that's one example of how they have different plans for the town. I encourage you to find more examples throughout the text. All right, so let's like start looking for some ways to compare and contrast our narrator, which is Cornelius, to his friend Otis. Um, so when we compare them, we're finding how they're similar. And when we contrast them, we find out how they're different. So um, if I looked back on page 72, that would be this page right here, um, I see that he's eavesdropping on his mom. Um, he's wanting to hear what's going on. So something that I could say about Otis or uh, Cornelius as a character would be that he's curious. Uh, but I don't want to put curious on here. I could. Uh, but I want to put a fifth grade word for being curious, which would be inquisitive. So it me it's a synonym for curious. It means he's curious about what's going on and he wants to know. So I'm just going to put a stronger vocabulary word under Cornelius. Um, but now let's go back to that page and let's look at his friend Otis and compare Otis to him. Um, Otis is curious as well, except for he's waiting for information from his friend. So right here, 
um, he's talking like, what's the deal? What's going on? And he just keeps poking and poking to get Cornelius to tell him what's going on. So the character trait or what I could infer about Otis is that he's impatient. Ooh, I misspelled inquisitive. I did mean inquisitive. So let's go to Otis here. And let's put that he's impatient. He can't wait for his friend. I gotta make sure I spelled it right. Uh, he can't wait for his friend to tell him what he knows or what he's heard. So that would be me comparing the or contrasting, I'm sorry, those two. But what can I say about both characters that's similar? Well, I do know that they are best friends and that they're around the same age. So I could even add the fact that they're the same age here. See how those boys were similar. Um, what I want you to do is to continue to look throughout the text and find ways that those two characters are different from each other. How, but do you, make sure that you do what I did, which was looking in the text and not just writing the text evidence down, but looking in the text and making an inference, which is something that's not said by the author. So you kind of have to pull those character traits from the text evidence, and you do that by putting it in your own words. All right, that's all I have for you guys today. Um, I will see you again tomorrow, and we will finish up Operation Clean Sweep. Bye.